This is a University of Otago podcast. Okay, so I'm now going to hand Thank over to Thank you very much. My name is Kok Wing Lai. People call me Wing. And I will spend the next maybe 10 minutes talking and then you will then talk back and then we'll have a discussion. Whenever I have a presentation, I always use this picture, a 14th century picture. People don't know who actually painted this, but if you look at this picture, that woman was me. Obviously, those are the monks, right? And then, how strange that a woman is teaching a group of monks. 14th century. And what was she teaching? Look at all this mathematics, must be, right? How could a woman teach a group of monks which should be quite learned, right? Quite knowledgeable, mathematics. I, I am the, that woman. How can I stand here with all these experts here in distance learning talking about my program, right? So it reminds me that you can't teach. You are here to learn. That means I can't teach you. I'm here to learn. Well, learning is not a spectator sport. That's why I am not going to talk a lot. And you will talk. So we will talk together. Is it okay with you? Yeah, give you a chance to talk. I, I was going to report an evaluation study of the Doctor of Education program, right? But when I was sitting on my chair, listening to all these talks, I thought you would not be very interested in, the, in a doctoral, doctor of education program that you, you have no idea what it is. And about a study, a qualitative study, uh, with all these interviews, transcripts, you wouldn't be interested. So I will probably change my topic now. <laughs> no, I will spend a lot more time in the first part of it, of the design process. How did I come into designing a, a program like this? Right? So that if you are interested in designing a program in the future, you may gain some insights, maybe. Right? So that may be more beneficial to you rather than listen to a research study. But I will still finish, I will still finish all my studies. But I, I will skip all the rest, right? 2007, the University Faculty of Education merged with the Dunedin College of Education. Right? So the Faculty of Education at the university was a very small one. The Dunedin College of Education was very big. Okay? When we merge, one of the issues is that how are we going to upgrade the qualifications of the staff at the college? As you know, PBRF, we need to upgrade, we need to do research. Now, that was one of the issues that we had to face at the time. We were actually asked by the ministry to produce new programs after the merge. Okay, so that, that's our issue at hand at the time. And also, we've been offering all these teacher education programs, postgraduate certificates, postgraduate diploma, master of teaching, for a long time. Many teachers have been requesting that, okay, how could they further upgrade their study to a doctoral level? And we have teachers who live in central Otago, in, in, in Chicago, uh, somewhere. They wanted to do a doctorate, but they would not be able to come to Dunedin to do it. And of course, the PhD in education at that time, but even now, was very small. The program was very small. During the merger, I, if I still recall correctly, we only had probably 20 PhD students in education because we require them to be full-time students. So very few students actually could come to the needed. So we have a problem that we want to solve. That means we have an issue that we have to tackle. So whenever you want to design something, you can't just say, I'm interested in something. You need to see whether there's a need of doing it to begin with, okay? Then, who is going to do it? So you got to get someone who actually has some experience of doing it. Because previously, we have already offered 
our postgraduate diploma in, in teaching. We have done a master of teaching. We have done a postgraduate certificate in teaching. So we have the experience of doing it, right? Then when I was asked to develop this program, no, I was not being asked, actually. I uh, warranty myself uh, to, to do this. I need to find out what sort of support I had, right? I talk, well, obviously, I talked to the dean. I talked to the um, PVC at that time. And then I talked to the DVC, Professor Gareth Jones. I talked to the director of postgraduate study at the university. I talked to many people to see whether I would have the support, right? And then I need to be knowledgeable myself. So I went to UK to visit four universities because they offered the Doctor of HG program to see how they did it. I went to Australia for two universities and discussed with them. I went to Hong Kong and there were seven universities I have visited to gather all this information from actual people. And then I did a literature review. I actually could write a paper. I was thinking of writing a paper on this actually, but I didn't have time to write it. I did a literature review of how actual people did it and what were the issues. And there were very few online a decent doctor of education program or doctoral programs at that time. We we're talking about 2007. Very few. And then at the University of Otago, there was none. There was actually only one doctoral program, which was a professional doctoral program in dentistry. Only one. So there were many barriers that I had to face when developing this program. Because there were oppositions within university and outside university. Because when you develop a program at the New Zealand University, it has to go through QAP, the Committee of University Academic Program Committee, which is a committee with, set up by all the universities in New Zealand. So you submit a program, and then they have a committee which will look at it. Not only that, your program will be sent to all other universities. And other people will then comment, question your program, and then all these questions will send back to you, and then you will have to defend those, those uh, questions. You have to answer those questions before they actually meet. So our positions will not just come from Otago, but elsewhere in New Zealand, because they don't want you to po produce a program similar to them, because there's com competition of students, right? Then why should I do it? I saw a need of doing that, but I also saw a need to do something different. The first difference was obviously it was a distance program, right? The second difference that I saw was why do we want to do a doctor of education if we have already got a PhD in education? There must be some distinction between these two. So what we did was that this is a professional degree. Although it's a research degree, it's recognized in New Zealand as a research degree, not a, not a, not a taught, taught degree, but with a professional focus. So we have to make it very professional in the sense that the research the students are doing have to be linked very closely to practice. So that are the issues that I face. So that I came up with this program structure. In all other universities in New Zealand, for a professional doctorate, it will be 360 credit points, okay, as you know. 240, two thirds of it, must be a thesis. So that's why it, has, it is a research degree, it's not a taught degree, okay? And one third of it can be taught. What I did was that, no, only 60 points of it will be taught as the coursework, 60%, we turn it into a portfolio, which we call it a research to practice portfolio, right? For a reason, then I will explain why, okay? Because doing that, we can actually tackle, solve some of the questions that I just raised, okay? That is the rationale behind. Is it okay now? So you have some understanding of what it is. If you work in the field, when you look at that structure, you, 
immediately you will ask questions. Because it's not an usual structure. Not just in New Zealand. Worldwide, you will not see this. So it's very, very different. Okay? To support these institutions academically and socially, we have to use a community of practice model. So we will have to work with them as a community. So students will be admitted as a cohort, right? And then they will be formed as a community to work together, okay? What we did was that at the beginning of the first year and the second year, we'll have a five-day residential school. They come to Dunedin, they socialize themselves, we we'll do some teaching, and then they know each other so that the community will be established from day one. Without that face-to-face -face meeting in the first part of the program, it's very difficult to develop a viable, uh, an exciting and program or community. It's very difficult, okay? And then, in the first year, the students will do an online course for 12 months as a community. Now, there is another question in mind. With students from such a diverse background, how do you do a coursework? Now, in those some big universities in the world, if they have 120 EDD students, there's no problem. Then you can have all different courses, and then they can choose, and then they can that, then do the courses. But we are a small program, right? As I told you, for the PhD, we only have 20. But with the EDD, we have a 50% increase every year, right away. So in the first year, we had like, like 12, 13 students, but it's only for the first year. But subsequently, we have six or seven, eight, maybe. But even then, it's a, it's a big group compared to PhD, but you cannot actually have courses for these only six or seven students, right? So that is very tricky. So what are you going to do with these, these 12 months? Then you turn it around. Instead of saying that this is an advanced study of a content area, this is an advanced study of your practice. This is about your practice. You are not advancing academic knowledge, but you are advancing practice knowledge. It's original. Even the, the knowledge is original. So the examination of thesis is exactly the same as the PhD, but you advance practical knowledge. So in that sense, you yourself are already an expert because we admit lead leaders in the educational field. We admit principals, HODs, lecturers, those people who know about their content by heart. But what they don't know about is how to be a better teacher, how to practice better, right? So in that 12 months discussion, we talk about the practice. There, there's a common ground about practice. And also, research methodologies. Because they've been away from studying maybe for a long time. To bring them up to the advanced doctoral level, they need to acquire methodologies of different types. So we spend that whole year doing that. 12 months of online study. Online discussions all the time. There's no lecture. We don't do lecture at all. So in each discussion, which will last like maybe two, two weeks, then there will be a topic. Okay, how, how to be a practitioner researcher? How to conduct research in this way? Then we'll provide them with some readings, and then we'll then discuss. We have questions, and then we'll discuss. Right? And then we have done that six, 12 months. In the second year, in the first part, they still work on the online community, to develop the proposals together, not individually. So each one will have a topic, but then they will have to present the topic, their literature review, their research questions, their methodologies in that community, and to be critiqued by other students and the supervisors. The supervisors are also members of the community, right? Then after six months or so, sometimes nine months, they will present this proposal publicly in a symposium. And after that, that will be confirmed. Well, if, if they're confirmed, right? If it will be examined. So we have external examiners coming in. 
So once they're con confirmed, they become a candidate, well, a, a real student in ID to start doing their research. So our process is rigorous, very rigorous. Because if in the first year, they had to do assignments. If they couldn't get certain level, they have to be deferred. If in the proposal, if they didn't pass, they will have to be deferred. They have to do it again. Until we are happy with their research proposal, then they will start doing research. Right? So that, that's, that's how it worked for us. Of course, we used this model in the discussion. Uh, Karen talked about Garrison and Terrison's model. But we actually go one step forward. Garrison and Terrison was talking about learning. We are talking about knowledge construction, knowledge building. Right? In fact, I have done studies with the students and see whether how they actually construct knowledge during the 12 months and during the proposal period. And result very positive. You, if you're interested, what are the references? Oh, the references will be in Karen's chapter in the book. Go to Karen's chapter, and then you will see. Because in in his in her chapter, she talked about research section, and she asked me to put in this reference in. So I put in some of my references there, and then you check. And then, why did I have to do that? I did quite a number of studies with, the, with the, this program because of people questioning initially about the quality of the program because that has not been done before in Otago and not been done in New Zealand in an online format. People would say, how can you do it online? You need face-to-face -face teaching. How can you do it as a community? How, do you, how can you use a portfolio? to examine a student. Not possible. So I, I thought I needed to defend this because I will not be here forever to defend it verbally, right? So if it's all written down in papers, and Karen, well, go to that paper. You read that paper. You know that they have constructed knowledge. You, read the other paper, you know that they've been communicating well. There's a social environment. You read the other paper, you will know. So I've written all these papers for people in the future, right? When I cannot stand here to defend it, OK? During the QA process, quite a few universities actually asked me a lot of very hard questions. Because the program was so new, they have not seen it before. They questioned, can it be done? Of course, the program went through QWeb smoothly with our hitch, right? But that has imprinted in my mind that there were people outside Otago which were not very positive about this program. So I need to show them evidence. That is why this, this particular presentation was done also because of that. Even though I have, uh, we have since graduated, we have praises from the examiners, we have we have all this proof. I still say I still wanted to do one last one to confirm, OK? So the research and practice portfolio, they have to do four things. They have to collect evidence throughout their study periods. The first part of the portfolio is about a statement, an essay, showing the readers why, how, what they have done, which has a relationship between research and practice. Okay? The second part of it is that they, they, have now, they now have two communities of practice. One is their EDD, their student cohort community. The second one is they are asked to form a local community, a local practice community. If there is a teacher, they need to form a community with other teachers, or they can form one online on the particular practice, and work through these two communities. They have to use these two communities to support their research. And they also have to feed back to the community. That's why they have to contribute evidence that they have presented a seminar in their, in their own school, or they present it in a conference 
professional conference or academic conference, those, all this evidence will be included in the portfolio to be examined at the end of the study. Okay? Then you will have a question in mind. Workload. That will be a huge workload then. Right? Because other than doing the thesis, they will have to do that again. Okay? Sorry. Ten minutes. Okay, done. So in that is my last study. I, I would say this will be my last study in the EDD because I'm no lo longer co-ordinating the program. I, I stepped down in 2013. In 2013, we had already six graduates for the program. I thought, okay, they have done this research to practice portfolio. They have gone through the whole program already for six years. They will be able to tell me whether they like or not, whether they have gained anything or not, whether they, yeah? So I say, okay, do a qualitative study at the end of it with these six students. Five of them consented, they would do it, one didn't want to do it. So I interview those five students, right, to see what they feel about the community and also the portfolio. Now, there are five, there are five themes that I can pull out. Of course, this quantitative study, uh, I use thematic approach, you know, that's the thing. So, the first one is about the academic social support. So, obviously, I pull out all these comments, right? So, you don't want to read, or I don't have time to show you. Anyway, but you can, you can read the chapter in the book, okay? Uh, then, they think that the distinguishing factor between the PHG and the ED is about the portfolio. It's a research and practice thing. Okay, and then they comment on that. I wish I could actually talk about this. And the practice, the practice community, that means the local community, provides them a link between research and practice. Because they always have to talk to practitioners about their research. How do I improve it? How do I actually make it useful to your practice? So that that is a good link between the two. There were two students who were teachers at that time, and then they, they found it very difficult to conduct academic research, and with, which were relevant to their study, to their teaching as well. But the local community provided them with the support and the drive to make them move on. Um, Oh, that, that's, that, fun, that thing is very interesting that I, I, I didn't find that initially, that I didn't expect it happened. The portfolio encourages to document their research journeys. The, the word journeys appears many times in the transcripts. So I, this was my journey. I documented using the portfolio. I reflect back on it. Uh, that was the evidence I had. You know, those are the so, uh, some of the uh, quotations. Workload issues. Not a problem, they thought. A lot more work, but not really no more work. Because they did it along the way. It's not that they had to do it like from scratch. Okay? Uh, yeah, you, you look at it. Now, the overall value of, look at this one, to pull it all together, I feel that I had gained the purpose of learning now I was just documenting it and was like, well, painful, but necessary. Oh, don't say painful. No, cross that out. Necessary, it formalized like this process of reflective practice. Okay? Oh, I need to go. So in this presentation, I have shown you two innovative features of a program. Okay? And from the study, I am confident that these two features were useful to students, helping them to link research to practice, and also supporting them academically and socially. But you have to be careful that this is a very small study, a qualitative study, don't generalize this too far, okay? But you can, if you are going to design a program, I'm sure you can gain some insights from that, right? And the program is actually recognized by the tertiary teacher teaching excellence at the center. You know the center? The tertiary? Yeah. Which awarded Gordon or you? Is it? Or uh, uh, Gordon award? An award, you know? That's the thing. 
gave me a, a grant, a, a research grant, a publication grant to put the program into their site to showcase our program to the world. So that proves that after we have done all these things, not only the teachers, are, the students are very happy about that, the lecturers are happy about that, the outside world thinks that this is a good thing to do and should be showcased. So that means I don't need to do anything. That's why I stepped down. I didn't need to do any more thing about this program. OK, thank you. Oh, you need to know the last one. I hear and I forget. I'm sure that when you go out, you'll forget. I see, I remember, you see something. But I do, and I understand from Confucius, that you need to do it. If you, you will need to start practicing it before you can really understand it, I think. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wing. Um, I, I, you should have ended up with, my work is done. I've stepped down. <laughs> I think that's, that's wonderful. Thank you very much yeah, for that. Okay. Does anybody have a, a quick question for Wing? While, while uh, Kelly gets... You can always talk to me during lunchtime, whatever. Yes? I, Elaine. Elaine. You need the... Yeah? Do you need a... Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm struck once again how important it is to have those people involved in all aspects of learning. So, so sometimes I wonder, is it, what do you think, is it about the, the opportunity to connect with someone else that makes everything that you do in a learning space work better? It, is it more that, is that the kind of overarching context and that within that is the thing of connecting? Um, Community the, is always the, the thing in my mind. Yeah. In, I don't believe in, in passive learning. I don't believe in uh, individual learning. Although individual learning happens all the time, right? I believe in when you work with people, like if, even if you talk to people, you have ideas, right? When you listen to people and then you feedback, you know, you gain ideas. Many of my ideas in the past so many years, they were not my ideas at all. They were from talking to Karen or Fiona or whoever, and then that, those ideas come. So only when you work within the community, then you can gain. Everyone will gain. Right? So I truly believe in collaborative learning, community learning, and not just by yourself. And it's not the society works. The society works by collaborating. You can't actually work all by yourself. No, no, no way. Any other question? And we'll... Looks like Kelly's ready. Thank you. Thanks, Wing. Thank you. Um,